Hi everyone. Uh, so we're going we're going to get started now. Um, I want to welcome you to, welcome you to our conversation today, which is jointly sponsored by uh, EE three hundred and eighty, which is a legendary Stanford class that's been around. I'm told for uh, a half a century, um, a roughly a half a century, and the Asilomar Microprocessor Workshop, which is now virtually, sadly, in its forty sixth year. Um, my name is John Markoff. I'm a fellow at the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. And uh, before we go any farther, I want to uh, say a thank you to Dennis Allison. Um, Dennis gets credit for organizing, uh, doing much of the organizing work of this event. And uh, I just wanted to say that um, I've known Dennis since either the late 70s or the early 1980s. And when I was a cub reporter, Dennis was the source to die from. Dennis was someone who knew everyone in Silicon Valley. So you just had to ask Dennis uh, who you should talk to and Dennis would tell you. Um, uh, there was an interesting situation early on when I was at Byte Magazine where there were two startup companies. One was called Forefront and one was called, the other was called Forethought. And I showed up at the wrong company and uh, Dennis was on the board of both companies. And so, I uh, know he, he was an advisor to both companies uh, because his students were at both companies. And he showed up at the wrong company and took me to the right company. So very well connected guy. Um, today, I, I think you, you'll see the, if you could put the speakers on the screen, you'll see the speakers' names on your screen. I'm gonna ask the panelists to briefly introduce themselves rather than taking a lot of time to introduce people um, so that we can get right into it. Um, our topic is coming attractions. Um, and Dennis has called it death or utopia in the next three decades. And I assume that if we weren't in the middle of a global pandemic, this would have been dystopia or utopia, but um, he's being very blunt. And um, <laughs> by, by way of uh, introduction, I, I just wanted to say that um, the way we envision the future is not irrelevant. And I can give you a couple of very specific examples of why I believe that's true and um, why how we view the future actually uh, is significant in shaping the future. Um, when I started work on a recent book, I discovered um, that several, actually many well-known artificial intelligence scientists had come into the field because of something they read in usually science fiction or saw. Um, for example, Rod Brooks and Jerry Kaplan, who were two early pioneers in the field of robotics and artificial intelligence, went into the field um, after they watched the movie uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. They both decided they wanted to build HAL. Now, that's not the reaction I would have had, but go figure. And furthermore, um, Adam Chire and Tom Gruber, who were the two technical architects of Siri, Apple's uh, speech interface, both are AI scientists, both decided they wanted to build Siri after they saw an Apple public relations video um, produced by John Scully in the late 1980s called Knowledge Navigator. And that led them directly to Siri. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, our conversation, you know, so if this is a consensual hallucination, we should pay attention to it, is my argument. Um, so our conversation is going to be wide open today. Um, you can touch on economy, culture, politics, biology, technology. But I wanted to start with the lens um, as wide open as we can uh, make it. And um, I wanted to start with climate. And so uh, I wanted to, you know, we're, we're really lucky we have Michael Mann, who's a, a well-known climate scientist with us today. And I wanted to start by asking, Michael, if you could frame the consensus in the climate community about climate over the next three decades to sort of give us the, the broadest uh, you know, playing field we can to get started on? Yeah, thanks, John. It's great to be part of this conversation. Um, well, it's interesting because there were a couple of time horizons that were actually spelled out um, in the description of this, um, this event, uh, 2030 and 2050. And those happen to be very interesting uh, sort of time frames when it comes to uh, the issue of tackling the climate crisis, because as we have um, you know, widely heard now, uh, 2030, within the next 10 years, we've got to bring our carbon emissions down by a factor of two, and we've got to bring them to net zero, net zero emissions. That means uh, no more uh, carbon going into the atmosphere than is coming out of the atmosphere by 2050, by mid-century, if we are to avert warming the planet by more than 
about a degree and a half Celsius, roughly uh, three degrees, a little less than three degrees Fahrenheit, which is sort of a threshold of warming where we start to see the worst impacts of climate change. But let's be frank here. We are already seeing dangerous climate change take place. Um, on our television screens, uh, in our newspaper headlines, I did a sabbatical uh, early this year down in Australia where I literally watched the impacts, the dangerous and catastrophic impacts of climate change uh, play out in real time in the form of unprecedented bushfires in California, where this event is based. Uh, of course, you have seen unprecedented wildfires as well in recent years, and it's not rocket science. You take heat and drought, both of them exacerbated by the warming of the planet caused by fossil fuel burning and other uh, carbon emissions. You take that heat, you combine it with drought, you get unprecedented uh, wildfires. And as we're learning, as we continue to understand um, in, in greater detail some of the complexities about how climate change uh, works, we're finding that, in fact, the impacts are playing out in many respects faster and with a greater magnitude than our models predicted uh, just a decade or, or so ago. And that means the ice sheets, which are losing ice earlier, and so sea level is rising faster. And we're seeing the behavior of the jet stream change in ways that our models hadn't really predicted that give us those um, extreme, very stationary weather systems uh, that are associated with catastrophic extreme weather events like the, the bushfires and wildfires that I mentioned, uh, like the unprecedented floods and heat waves and droughts and superstorms that we have seen play out in recent years. So we don't have to use too much imagination to, to envision what our future could look like. Our, we could indeed uh, take a course if we don't act uh, if we don't act on this problem, if we continue with business as usual, burning of fossil fuels, and we warm the planet three, uh, maybe four degrees Celsius by the end of the century, um, seven, eight, nine degrees potentially Fahrenheit by the end of the century, then the worst impacts that we've seen thus far will become commonplace. The hottest day that we've ever experienced, we will just call that summer. Um, that's one possible future. That is a dystopian future. The good news here is that we hold the future within our own hands. If we act dramatically, if we shift away from fossil fuels, um, if we bring those carbon emissions down, as I said, by a factor of two over the next 10 years, which is possible with policies that incentivize a shift away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy, um, if we incentivize the decarbonization of our economy, then we can keep the warming to a level where yes, you know, we will be dealing with a new normal. The things that we've been experienced, the unprecedented you know, weather disasters that we've experienced, the flooding of our coastlines, there's no way to really reverse that, but we can adapt to those changes if we mitigate uh, further warming of the planet. But if we don't mitigate that warming, if we continue with business as usual, then it's not inappropriate to liken what we will see to the sorts of futures that Hollywood has portrayed, uh, the sor sorts of dystopian futures that, that Hollywood has envisioned. Th th that's a possible future. It's in our hands. It's up to us. Um, Michael, I'm going to ask the panel to respond to you, but before they do, can I ask if you've been able to put the pandemic into your models and um, how, has it changed, how has it changed what you're seeing? Yeah, so the pandemic uh, is sort of an interesting experiment that, that is playing out in real time. Um, what we're seeing is that the sort of lockdown and social distancing policies that we put in place to deal with the pandemic um, is actually impacting our carbon emissions. It's bringing our carbon emissions down. Uh, the estimates are in now that we'll probably see a 4 to 7% decrease in our annual carbon emissions uh, by, uh, you know, for this year uh, because of the lockdown. Now, that might seem like reason for optimism until I tell you that we need at least that much and maybe a 15% reduction in carbon emissions every year for the next decade. If we are with any degree of confidence to limit warming beyond those uh, dangerous thresholds. And so, yes, changing our behavior, not traveling and um, the sort of uh, social distancing and lockdown uh, activities that we've seen play out in recent months, those changes in our, our, our lives and our, our, our personal behavior, our individual behavior, it can impact our, our carbon emissions. It can bring them down a bit. Uh, but in order to see the wholesale shift that we really need 
from fossil fuel burning to renewable energy, the decarbonization of our economy, we need systemic change. We need policies that will incentivize that shift uh, away from business as usual because individual action alone, as we've seen from the pandemic now, isn't enough to get us the carbon emissions cuts that we need. Okay. Um, Carol or Carmen, could I begin by asking either of you to respond uh, to Michael, uh, thoughts on, on climate and energy? I can, uh, I can uh, go on this one. I've been thinking a lot, Michael, about systemic changes and whether our moment right now uh, creates imperatives for us to really address the root causes of the crises that are overwhelming our nation and the planet at this moment, uh, looking, for instance, systemically at the intersections between racial injustice, intergenerational injustice, economic policies, um, the, the climate changes you've just described, where would that kind of systemic thinking occur and will it address the radical roots of all of this uh, in time to create effective policies? Yeah, thanks, Carol. It's a great question. And it would be remiss for us not to be talking about, you know, what is playing out right now, the crisis that we're seeing. Of course, there's the climate crisis, there's the pandemic, and now uh, we have um, a, a crisis with our democracy um, where we're seeing a, a different sort of lockdown or a pushback against, you know, an uprising uh, of citizens who are speaking out about the injustices that we have, uh, you know, that we've become all too familiar with. And so there is... Um, sort of a, a, a field or, or almost a movement uh, known as climate justice, which recognizes sort of the intersectionality of all these things, that uh, ultimately uh, climate change um, is one of the greatest forms of uh, social uh, and racial injustice that there is because it turns out that the negative impacts are going to fall disproportionately on those with the least resources. Um, and so it is a, a matter of um, justice, um, of uh, uh, intergenerational justice, uh, racial justice, and we have arrived at this, you know, we've heard this term used so often now that it's becoming hackneyed, a perfect storm. But we, let's face it, we are seeing this perfect storm of, of things, factors that are coming together to lead us, I think, maybe to the point, and Barack Obama basically said this in a speech to the nation yesterday, to lead us to the point where maybe we're ready to re-envision um, our world. Um, and maybe, maybe we're ready to talk about how we create a better world, whether we're talking about environmental sustainability or basic issues of societal uh, justice, um, racial justice, intergenerational justice. We have this unique moment in time, and I'm hoping that we take advantage of it. Carmen, can I ask you to sure. uh, add your thoughts? Yeah, so... Um... By the way, thank you for the opportunity. My background is uh, I spent 32 years at CIA as an analytic uh, officer and a manager of analysts. Um, I, I'll say three things. One on the question of models. So I know from talking to people, my peers, colleagues, trying to convince them, friends in Texas, that the coronavirus and COVID-19 was real, they still, many of them doubt it, that models are not persuasive to a wide swath of people. And that in fact, models can be flawed. As, as Michael pointed out, the changes in the jet stream were not predicted by the models. So I think an attempt to mobilize the world around models, which I think the movement has been doing attempting to for a while has its limits. So that's, that's my first point. Two, I was struck by Michael's point that we would have to achieve, and I, I didn't write it down so I don't remember it exactly, but we would have to achieve a 15% reduction for the rest of the decade. Now, per year. What, what, per year. What per came year. to my mind was that we have to have this year for the rest of the decade yeah. over and over and over again. Yeah. Which... One has uh, equity and justice implications. 
uh, two just strikes me as practical, you know, unless in fact the pandemic in its second wave is, you know, a couple of times worse than the Spanish flu, seems uh, unachievable. So, and then my, so my third point is to deal with climate change and all the other issues we face, I think that we're going to have to find a positive thing for people to rally around, positive and inclusive, rather than negative and scary. One of my favorite uh, heuristic devices about how people think is that people tend to believe worst case scenarios are unlikely. You're seeing this play out with the pandemic. And no matter how much you warn people of what's happening, I think that they're going to dismiss it. And frankly, I don't think we have enough trust, interpersonal trust, not only in our society, but across the planet, for us to be able to mobilize a, uh, against a great negative, because that requires sacrifice from everyone. So somehow we have to flip this, and I don't know how, uh, so that it is a, a more positive conversation about moving to someplace better. And my, my last comment, I, and I do have some hope that if the coronavirus and the pandemic really creates a significant drag on the world economy for more than one year, that people will realize that the Green New Deal, for example, in a kind of cynical way, is the best way to restart the economy. That, in other words, the economy suffers so much that you can't really get it going again unless you engage in something dramatic and big to restart it. Banning, can I, can I ask you, um, Banning Garrett, um, can, I, can I ask you sort of whether, there's a, whether you believe there's a path for the United States back into the climate community? Um, we veered so far, and, and please introduce yourself. I'm sorry, Carol, I, next time you speak, I'll ask you to introduce yourself, but Danny, before you get going. Well, the most important thing is I was class of 67 at, at, at Stanford. Um, but beyond that, I've done other things since then, but I did stuff on U.S.-China relations for about 40 years and consulted with the U.S. government on that and then worked with the National Intelligence Council, uh, not as a member of the government, but as an out so a consultant on the global long-term global trends and the Nick global trends reports, which I think are very important. I mean, certainly Carol and, and Carmen know them quite well. Uh, so that's led me to real interest in long-term trends and the impact of technology, uh, exponential technologies on society. So I think that, first of all, I think that the next six, eight months <clears throat> are world historically critical period, maybe the most important decisive point in, since World War II perhaps, because we could go one path, which we see is, is uh, intended by the current administration. And if that continues, I think we're going to have a very difficult time in transitioning to really meet the challenges that Michael's talked about and Carol and Carmen. <clears throat> I, I just don't see it. I think we are headed potentially even towards a very autocratic regime and dismantlement even more of our scientific capability and particularly in, in government. So, but on the other hand, we have the opportunity if we change and, and uh, Biden is president, I think he's gonna, you know, could take us in a very different path and go, I think uh, Carmen's mentioned the Green New Deal is, is right on the money that we have to have a positive vision, like kind of no regrets policy that you're doing things that are good, whether or not you believe in climate change. And I've always felt that the biggest thing that nobody ever seems to talk about, about energy, green energy is that the fuel is free forever. You're never again gonna have to pay Texas or Saudi Arabia to import fuel and keep, it's like addicts every day you pay for this fuel. Why not have it be free? And that makes a huge difference in the global economy and certainly in the economy of a state or a city. So I think we have a possibility of moving in a very different direction that makes a lot of sense to people and could be sold as a vision. And I think we, you know, there's a lot of things we can do that will be the green economy that will put people to jobs I'm for more and more production of food in, in cities and in the rural areas around them. And technology can really lead us to do that in a much more efficient and, and inclusive way. That's a lot of jobs, more production of, of goods, 3D printing and other things, more at the point of consumption rather than moving goods all over the world. I can see a very different economy that has a lot of benefits to us, but not so beneficial to the petrostates. 
and uh, reduces the global impact of all of our economy and yet offers a lot of jobs and a lot of uh, way forward. So I think the, the, vision, the vision thing is what we really need. And, but there, there are paths forward that are very beneficial across the board and, and dealing with climate justice, as Michael put it, and, and jobs and inclusivity. But it's gonna take, you know, the, the question is, can we restore faith in government and experts and the fact that we need government, we created it for a reason and we need it and we've shown through the complete failure uh, of our health system to be ready for this pandemic and not putting, putting aside the leadership that's also failed as well, that we, if there's a lot we need to do, but there may be public support for it as a result of what we've seen in this pandemic. The health of everybody is important to everybody else. Maybe we need universal health coverage for me to be secure, not just be out of compassion and concern for others. You know, the public health started, in, as I understand, in New York, when the rich people were getting sick but from the immigrants that brought cholera. And they said, oh, we, maybe we don't want those people to get sick because we're going to work for me and, and get me sick. So maybe there's a, a, a sea change in how people look at the health of others and the need for universal health care. And then there's basic income. There's all these things have been brought to fore. And now we see that the, the racial dimension of this is, is incredible and, and, and so uh, key to, to this country's future. And, and so I, are we going to address that? Well, I think we have the possibility. And again, it depends on the next six months. And then you look at America's position in the world. And we're headed towards, you know, little America alone being ridiculed by the world. And, but more importantly, the geopolitical uh, collapse into a kind of zero sum strategic competition rather than putting cooperation first. Can the U.S. emerge again to be it take a while to really build trust, but we are the necessary leader in, in climate change and on pandemics, on science and global cooperation, putting global cooperation ahead of the competition. We, we could do that. We have the potential, I think. Maybe the world will, they'll be distrustful for a long time and we could have another Trump someday, but I think they want us to lead. We need, we're the ones that, we're the essential partner there. And we have to work with the Chinese, figure out how to do this. So we have a whole agenda of things that we're headed again, you know, we can go one way where we don't, we don't even set the foundation for, for the kind of alternative futures that we all want to see. Or we can really move forward and maybe leapfrog because people are ready to move much faster now than they ever would have been before the COVID crisis. So it's, it's like I said, I think we're in this really inflection point that could go either way. And, and if it goes the way that I hope it goes, uh, then I think we have a real potential to do it, to reimagine, to do new things, to do really bold things, FDR level things. So I, I think it's, you know, we have this a, a, a conversation January 20th that will be very different. Benning, uh, I wanted to go to Megan next. But before I go, uh, one thing you said sort of sparked a question in my mind. You know, we both came from, uh, grew up at a time where 1968 as a, a period in time was very influential on us. And I was wondering if you see any echoes of 1968 in the, in the coming summer, if you will. Well, I think that one difference is at that point on foreign policy, we had, you know, the Cold War consensus, basically. We didn't have the deep divisions that we have now. And I think even our part, you know, we had bipartisanship in Congress in responding to various crises and things. We don't have that. I mean, I think in, in many ways, we're in a deeper, deeper well at this point than we were even in 68. And believe me, I was, out, you know, out there in the, in the streets with, with John. <laughs> <laughs> about the Vietnam War and all, but I think this is this is even more um, of an inflection point. We could go in a very much worse direction because unleashed this administration, just imagine what could happen. Uh, but if we have the opportunity, maybe we can build a new consensus. But I, I think it's certainly the riots and the, you know, the reaction to, to it, it, we had to the, the assassination, but on the one hand, assassination of Kennedy and, and um, uh, MLK and then the Tet Offensive and the collapse of the Vietnam policy. I mean, a lot of things was going on there <laughs> and we were all very concerned about it. But I, I think this is in many ways maybe worse uh, in terms of the potential impact where we might be in a year uh, is much, I mean, more positive possibility maybe, but also very, very negative. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I think there's a lot of, a lot of bad things are going to happen between now and January myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
Megan, I'm glad you're in one place now. I was I was worried about asking you questions where I thought you might crash. Um, <laughs> I wanted to. Can you introduce yourself? And also, I wanted to ask you. You're the most, I think, the most recent refugee from the government of, <laughs> on our panel. Um, I wanted to ask you about the possibility of a, a path for the United States back into being a, a, a world a world citizen. Do, do you see a path? Um, so, um, thank you. Uh, John, I really resonate with uh, what everybody's talking about. And um, I'm going to go to that question, but the first thing I want to do, especially because we're talking about climate, and I think we need to think in systems ways, I want to actually do a land acknowledgement uh, that I've learned from Native American leaders uh, and youth, that we acknowledge the planet we're on and, and the people who were here first, and the genius, indigenous knowledge that they have that we could learn from to work on not only climate, but community benefit focused um, culture, uh, not necessarily profit culture, but community benefit, profit can be part of community benefit, certainly it's a business model. Um, and you know, here in DC where I live, uh, the Powhatan tribes, the Piscataway, Conway, others, and wherever we are physically, and you know, who was here first and how did they think and how might we go back to the future um, together? Uh, in order to understand and, and be thinking in good ways. And I think it's interesting also to notice um, exactly what's happening right now. And there's two things. It's, it's great you mentioned 1968, 1969. We just celebrated an incredible um, launch of the first commercial uh, spaceship um, to send astronauts uh, up to the space station. That's happening simultaneously with the inequality protests with this uh, horrific murder um, in Minneapolis of George Floyd and, and of Brittany and of the Brianna and the, of the other people who have, you know, we can say their names, we need to say their names. And I wanted to bring this forward. Um, if, uh, let's see if I can just make sure you can see it. This was a, a tweet out of the King Center, right? Privileges is um, saying, you know, privilege is when you think something is not a problem because you aren't pers affected personally. And I think we have a lot of imbalance. I'm in the National Academy of Engineering. Um, and I find we list the grand challenges for the future, you know, for young people to work on, and we leave out justice mm -hmm. as if that's not an engineering and science problem. Um, it's a problem of any tool of the universe. Uh, and it's, it's with us right this moment because Ida B. Wells just won the Pulitzer Prize. Now, Ida is one of the greatest American data scientists, uh, journalists, who worked over 100 years ago um, on the same challenge that people on the streets on, uh, in this case, on lynching and the, the lies, the same thing as the bird watcher, you know, calling the police on people. It's a lie. Um, and so how does this relate to climate? I think the disrespect of talent and the respect of some talent, the imbalance of who gets to play is really hurting us all because there's so many genius people who would cure cancer, solve climate, whatever, but they, they don't get the job. You know, they get passed over because of longstanding systemic oppression and bias. Um, you know, in the 60s, Katherine Johnson was calculating trajectories for John Glenn and the Apollo 11 mission you know, an African-American woman mathematician, genius, you know, um, she, she, you, there's a great video of her, you know, you can tell the math is still in her mind and she did, we lost her recently, but she's talking about where the moon would be when they get there and people really did this. That really happened, but I never saw her in a movie, you know, and so we thought one group does it and one group doesn't. And then the one group who does have privilege think they're the savior solver of the other rather than just look around. So one of the things I learned in government was to just start looking around for who had already fixed the problem or had something promising. I call it scout and scale. And specifically on climate, we found genius people all over the world. We did this with the UN. We just asked on the web, who's already fixed the sustainable development goals? Who's, already, who's, who's working on this already? And just like in Silicon Valley, the venture capitalists don't make the companies. They find Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Larry Sergey, these people, you know, uh, Steve Jobs. So let's find more people and come up underneath them. I'm the co-founder of the Malala Fund because Malala would be the best person in the world to help us get girls to education, to lead us, and then all of us can join her. Do you see that vision? So I 
think that because of systemic bias, we did things like forgot to have tech in the room, in our government, in all meetings, just like we would have a lawyer or a surgeon general or a communicator or others. So civic tech is encouraging right now because it's growing. Nonprofit philanthropic tech that Ida B. Wells in data science in the Department of Justice would be just as important as data science at NASA. And that, um, you know, tech doesn't come later, it's part of the architecture. And certainly techies are very arrogant, we're all arrogant, you know, we're just going to fix it with our tech. But it's not about that, it's about the harder problems of the world. Um, one of my favorite examples of one of the hardest data science problems to solve right this minute is feeding children free and reduced lunch when they're not in school. We have 22 to 30 million children who get free to, and reduced lunch. And then in the summer, we only feed 6 million. And yet somehow a self-driving car is more important to work on, which is also a big data problem, right? Like, and I don't mean or, I mean and. Let's work on that and, let's do it. And so the last thing I would share just in this particular comment is, is this, I tweeted out this uh, story. There's Ralph Abernathy. Again, this is uh, the summer of 69 at the, sh at the um, Apollo 11 launch. Most people don't know that the same group that did the March on Washington in 68, we were talking about 68, protested the Apollo 11 launch. And the head of NASA came to the perimeter to sit with Ralph. And Ralph said, you know, a great nation ought to be able to take care of those who are less fortunate as well as undertake space exploration. Not only that, you know, tech for foster care, tech for school lunch, tech, civic tech, nonprofit tech, but also how about all the talent gets to do what it would do and include it. And we use technology, you know, we've been working with USC and, and other Gina Davis Institute on using face recognition and natural language processing on media bias because we see one group all the time do everything and then the other group isn't in. So, uh, you know, how do we change our media? so that we hear more of the voices and we realize that Ada Lovelace invented computer science the same time Darwin thought of the history of us, she thought of the future of us. I wish to bequeath to the generations a calculus of the nervous system, 1840s. Yep, right? that's great. Thank you, Megan. Um, I want to bring in another force or factor. We've talked about climate, but I want to ask um, both John Hennessy and Paul Staffo uh, about Moore's Law. Um, you know, Silicon Valley thrived on Moore's Law for 60 years now, and uh, it transformed the entire world during that period. But starting in 2014, 2015, and I'm the pessimist here, I began to see parts of that machine begin to slow down and perhaps stop. I mean, the cost of transistors stopped, stopped falling in 2015, and Moore's Law was defined not just by increasing, exponentially increasing computer power, but exponentially falling costs, which created these new industries or made it possible. Let me start with, by asking John, what if I'm right? What if Moore's Law is stalled for some significant period? Well, I, I think you are largely right, John. I think um, that and combined with the failure of what's called Dennard scaling, which says that the energy use um, also fell as the transistor count went up. So that what happened was computers got more powerful while taking less energy or the same amount. And both those trends have, uh, have uh, ceased. Dennard, Dennard scaling much more abruptly a Moore's Law sort of on the last tail. Uh, think of it as, as slowing down. Uh, I don't think there's anybody who realistically believes they're going to uh, reinvent Moore's Law and recapture uh, what we were used to. So that says we have to think very differently about computing. You've already seen this shift to the kinds of things that NVIDIA and Google are doing to build uh, processors which are which achieve much greater efficiencies, but for narrower tasks. So I think we're gonna to have to give up on the concept that we're gonna get truly general purpose uh, performance breakthroughs like we're used to and look for alternative mechanisms. There's one other comment I'll make on this, and that's um, there's a, a recent paper by Charles Lysison, Butler Lamson, and a group out of MIT called, uh, there's plenty of room at the top which uh, analyzes the way in which we do software production right now. Lots of people code in Python, for example, and they take a piece of Python code 
and then gradually transform it into C, C++, and optimize it for the machine. And in the end, their final piece of code runs 60,000 times faster than the original Python code. So a way of thinking about this is because hardware was making so much progress, we in the software industry naturally said, let's move, the, let's move our programming paradigms up the abstraction level, make it easier for people to build code, but much less efficient. We may have to go back and recapture some of that, whether it's by a new programming mm-hmm. model. There's an opportunity there we're going to have to exploit. Thank you. And um, I'm bad at this. Uh, John was president of Stanford, he's chair of Google, and he's the co-author of a wonderful uh, text on computer architecture. Paul, can I, can I put, Paul Sappho, can I put the same question to you, the consequences of whatever's going on with Moore's Law? I, um, I can't decide what would be a bigger problem if Moore's Law starts stalling out or if Moore's Law stops stalling uh, and continues accelerating. Um, it's the the issue isn't Moore's law. The issue is the growing gap between how our culture adapts and how fast our technologies are advancing. So we have an exponential part of our lives in the technology sphere, and we have a non-exponential part at a at a cultural level. And in a way, this conversation to me feels a little bit like a microcosm of what's going on globally, that we're, we're standing on a whale distracted by minnows. Um, you know, when I think back to the pandemic, I, I'm of the opinion that the, the virus is of absolutely no consequence. It is the response that we have had. Um, in my career as a forecaster, and I've worked as a forecaster, some would call me a futurist in the valley for 30 years. You, you might call me a futurist with a past. And I teach at Stanford that there are two events in my professional career that have been absolutely anticipated more than anything else. And one of them is the pandemic. Uh, we all knew it was coming. And the problem is that we utterly failed to respond. And I find that profoundly depressing because the only other event that has been more predicted than the pandemic is, of course, climate change. So in that sense, it really has nothing to do with technology. What what we're seeing is, quite simply put, the pandemic is a test and human humankind is failing it. We're in the midst of an anthropological crisis and it ain't gonna be fixed with technology. Uh, it is not going to be fixed at the national level. You know, the United States as a certain French minister said to me over coffee about 10 years ago, he happens to be the French president now, he says the US, too big to ignore, too weak to make a difference. So um, let me uh, move to geopolitics and let me throw this out to the panel as a whole. Um, You know, the United States has clearly stepped off the world stage, at least for the moment. Um, What about China? Um, Would somebody like to address the role of China over the next 30 years? Um, Will China be the the world's next superpower? Raise your hand or start speaking. I'm I'm happy to, since I, I, yeah, um, because it relates to, you know, how we started the conversation, climate change. And right now we're actually seeing uh, the U.S., as you've alluded to, as we've all alluded to, sort of um, we're losing leadership um, when it comes to uh, issues like tackling climate change. In fact, the current administration has threatened to be the only country in the world to actually withdraw from the Paris Agreement. So we're going in the wrong direction and we're seeing the Trump administration dismantle environmental protections that were put in place by the Nixon administration, by the Bush administration, by the Reagan administration. That's how quickly we're moving in the wrong direction. Um, And that vacuum of leadership on issues uh, like climate, um, in that vacuum, we are seeing countries like China. One of the interesting things about a a sort of command and control country like China is that it can act uh, quickly and deliberately um, when it comes to these sorts of major challenges. And that is certainly the case when it comes to uh, 
the, the issue of climate change, where China is actually now leading the world when it comes to uh, the manufacturing of solar panels, um, wind, solar. Um, they are spending more. They are developing technology that the rest of the world is benefiting from um, in uh, the renewable energy space. And they were actually on course to dismantle coal-fired power plants. China was not only not building new coal-fired power plants, they were dismantling coal-fired power plants. And then a couple of years ago, well, actually now nearly four years ago, um, we elected, uh, or the Electoral College <laughs> put in place a president um, who, uh, in fact, signaled to the rest of the world that the United States, one of the two largest uh, emitters of carbon in the world, uh, was not willing to meet its obligations. And that took the pressure off of China. And we've actually seen China sort of pull back a little bit. They've, they've started to build some new coal-fired power plants and they're not moving as quickly in the direction that we need to go because of it. So, you know, as we alluded to previously in this conversation, what is so vital about this moment in time is that in a matter of months, we have the opportunity to choose to go in a completely different direction, to regain our stature as a leader when it comes to issues like climate change, to join the world uh, community and to set an example and create incentives for countries like China to jointly engage in this effort to you know, preserve the livability of this planet. It's no lesser a challenge than the challenge to preserve the livability of this planet. Carol or Carmen, do you have thoughts on China? I wanted to make a comment, yes, on China. Thank you, John. One is, I just want to, one comment is, let's be cautious about the vocabulary that we use. So the word superpower, what does that really mean, given the range of threats or issues, uh, challenges that we're facing in the future? What is China a superpower about? I mean, it's just a term that when you use it, people think they know what it means, but uh, it, there is no consensus on what that term really means and the importance of that concept anymore in world affairs. The a second thing I will say about China, and this returns back to my point about positivity being a more powerful force, galvanizing force than negativity. The one thing that China has it all over the US right now is a sense of social unity. It's framed, and of course, it's uh, supported, undergirded by a very clever system of social monitoring and control. But my experience was when you talk to Chinese citizens that they, they will say something like, I know that we're not much of a democracy right now, but we're headed in the right direction and we're making a more powerful society. And I think that is, something which the U.S. has lost and sadly may continue to lose depending upon, re actually regardless of who wins the election, we may still find ourselves lacking the social cohesion to deal with difficult problems. Carol, thoughts on China? Well, I'd like to take it in a little different direction, but you asked me to introduce myself first. Yes. Um, like, Car like Carmen, I spent 33 years in the U.S. intelligence community, almost all of it at the CIA as an analyst, but also in the Department of Energy, looking at energy and environmental security issues. I, I designed and taught a course on global uh, climate change and global security, which I taught after retiring, and I've been looking at uh, lately COVID 19 futures and their implications for the US. Um, with regard to China, my brain kind of goes to the global challenges um, we all face, COVID-19 being one of them. And uh, we can look, as Paul said, to the reaction, which has been very concerning. Nations have basically turned inward at a time when we still um, have a lot of globe-spanning challenges. In fact, most of the challenges we face, if we want to call them security issues, we can, but they're also just human living issues. Um, they're, they're global in nature. Um, I've been doing some thinking about how we might look back on our times, let's say 30 or 40 years from now, and I'm, I'm kind of captivated by the idea of uh, what happened in the 18th century with the so-called enlightenment 
which in, in, a, in um, turn was a reaction to the biggest natural disaster Europe had, has experienced even to this day. It was, a, a it was one of the factors, I should say, and that was the Lisbon earthquake. And there are a lot of Europeans today that don't even know there was an earthquake in 1755, but a lot of the intellectuals at the time started to wrestle with, well, how could a, an earthquake like that occur in a world where everything that happens happens because God wanted it to happen. Why? And there's a bigger story there. But I see the Brexit and um, the election of 2016 in the U.S. as sort of our earthquake. And if I were imagining how we might look on our on our century right now, um, some decades ahead, um, we're going to have to see uh, the world in a very different way. We're going to have to re think man's place in the natural world um, in a way that radically builds or maybe shifts from the, the findings of the Enlightenment. And a lot of the things that people have said so far today ha are pieces of that, including uh, what Megan was talking about. We're going to have to have a new appraisal, you know, the whole Anthropocene knowledge about how we're basically living on a different planet already with the CO2 emissions higher than they've ever been in human history. Um, I'm not sure where all this thinking is gonna happen. Everything here so far today has been pretty interdisciplinary, but I'm not sure where the epicenter of this is going to be. Um, but whether we can think systemically about how these things interconnect will determine you know, whether humanity survives. And I don't mean mankind as a species, but I mean, the idea of humanity, I think by 2030 could be gone if we don't uh, reappraise our circumstances now. So that's why I asked the original question to Michael Mann. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I wanted to bring up a couple of other sort of forcing functions or large forces in the world. And one of them, you know, Silicon Valley um, was driven by immigration, um, is driven by immigration. It's been a magnet for the best and the brightest um, and I've, I actually believe very deeply that that is one of the reasons that Silicon Valley is what it is. I wanted to ask Paul about, um, you know, we're, we're, we're on the brink of ending immigration, you know, nationally and perhaps to Silicon Valley. Um, what does that do to Silicon Valley? And, and, you know, I guess the larger question here is, in the next 30 years, where is the center of innovation in the world? Is, are there centers? Does it change in some significant way, Paul? Um, well, you know, it was Annalise Saxanian who famously said Silicon Valley is not spread out widely, but packed to closely together. And that's why people bump into each other and start companies and do innovation. And so really the question is, is not which particular region will succeed, um, but rather where will people spend most of their time bumping into each other? And all the indicators are that increasingly that'll be in cyberspace. And it's, it's clear that we're, we're poised on the edge of another social media shift that'll come out in the next three and a half years. It's gonna make um, the cyber, cyberspace experience as a social space even more vivid. So I think the short answer, it's, the, it's gonna start in cyberspace and then they will, it will land in the physical regions that are most amenable to supporting startups and the like. So I see a lot of competition around the planet for, um, for brains. Yeah, any other thoughts about innovation going forward in the next 30 years? Uh, Megan first. Yeah, I don't know if I could screen share, but I'd love to show you some images of what this could look like, um, if that's an option. I think is that, so. Let me see if this is working. I'm just going to screen share. Do you guys see that? Yeah. Okay, cool. So one of the things I think, you know, uh, is that there's talent everywhere. We did this solution summit of the United Nations and uh, looking at who already was doing the SDGs, who's already doing this. And we got um, the first year, we've done it five years, uh, I think 800 submissions. Last year, 1,400 submissions from 141 countries in three weeks. Bam, right? Wow. 
And so, you know, instead of only the folks who get to know how to contact a VC or philanthropy, this was a really broad group of people. It's a live spreadsheet. It's an open process. My uh, co-founder, Susan Osner, who led public engagement at the UN, was the architect of how we do that. And just genius people. It's gender balance, geo balance, topic balance. These are some of the innovators, you know, flying drones to plant a billion trees a year, solving prison challenges. Uh, uh, people in Uganda doing that themselves. So um, the one I would point out just as an example is uh, the floating fab lab from Ben Juarez who grew up in the Amazon, he's in his indigenous community there. What if we have a makerspace floating fab lab instead of having cut down the trees job? You know, in this capacity for human capacity to do their thing. So thinking about all the doers, whether it's our students, and what their learning practice makes permanent or the or everyone else. So this is this example and I wanted to show you like Bernice in the middle there is from Ghana. She grows bikes. She literally makes bamboo bikes because they don't have as strong a seal industry. And so um, here's a way to sequester carbon, right? Uh, it's half women building beautiful designs and I uh, found metal as well as new metal. It's like uh, every 10, they give one away to a school child all over the country. You know, here she is with a mentorship ecosystem like we know from Silicon Valley with uh, people who can be accelerators of her, but she would never get that unless we reach out to her. You know, and she's got this wonderful company. We could do that everywhere. Here's Native American innovators from Pine Ridge, one of the poorest counties in the United States, Henry Redclap, Solar Genius, Rose. Um, with agriculture innovation. So MIT has a program that we work on with our Shift 17, finding uh, Standing Rock, Pine Ridge, Navajo, genius doers, who Silicon Valley, who I love my old colleagues, but like they never go here and they never ask what you got. Um, they wait for everyone to come, you know, and then there's so much more. These people could use the innovation. This is island innovators. We work with uh, the Polynesian Voyaging Society and some of the colleagues there, GLISPA Global Island Partnership. They are now doing video calls uh, from innovators who are already working, and you see Nainoa there on the screen. He led the team from the Hokulea. Think the movie Moana. This is human intelligence at a time of intelligent, artificial intelligence. Humans can actually sail with no instruments, not even a compass, around the world. That's so amazing. And here's some of the young navigators who are learning. Um, you know, when we were in the White House, we held a tech meetup of all the meetup organizers in our country who are already bringing tech to their communities and bridging, like Rec to Tech is an old rec center in Baltimore that has tech, nano, mega, little kids, big kids, just genius solutions. Um, this is the tech jobs tour. People, um, you know, just community organizing themselves into the new future, like a future of inclusive work. Boise, Idaho, Gaza, Afghanistan, there's so much activity, but no neighbors know. And the policy colleagues didn't know. So there's really an opportunity to take place and cohorting and all the stuff that we know is out there and, uh, and make that happen. I'll stop screen sharing now. But I just wanted to sort of infuse some enthusiasm for us for the opportunity, the opportunistic, or the opportunity of like inclusive innovation and really using our best of community organizing with our best of innovation techniques and our best of listening and design thinking to come up underneath the genius colleagues of our 7 billion colleagues on the world and listen for who's there. My last example that I'll give you is uh, in Los Angeles, Jean Holm, who works for Mayor Garcetti and is a data science faculty member at UCLA, created the Data Science Federation. So right now, sometimes we talk about how are we gonna get more kids into coding and that. She just took the data sets of the city, which don't always get as much attention as some of other data sets. And she assigns, she gets the city teams to list problems. And then young people, as part of their homework, work on, like work on your hometown for your homework, they work on data uh, prototypes for the city. It's real projects. What a fun way to learn computer science as a college or high school student, to work on a topic in your city like justice or transport or homelessness, and then come in. So thinking of peer colleagues, more is where I'm getting and respecting the talent on the planet, we could really move faster on innovation if we increase our surface area and really get rid of some of our biases and structural inequities. Thank you. Um, Michael, I, you know, in, in the chat stream, I've seen uh, fusion and nuclear come up a couple of times. And I wanted to sort of ask your view broadly about this transition that you're talking about that we need to make and whether nuclear will play a role in, in your view. 
Sure. Um, well, you know, here at Stanford or there at Stanford um, uh, is a colleague of mine, uh, Mark Jacobson, who's one of the leading experts um, in the world when it comes to sort of the renewable energy transition and what it will take to uh, decarbonize our economy. And, and he has published, you know, peer-reviewed work that demonstrates a very clear path forward to achieving uh, carbon neutrality by 2050, um, uh, getting most of the way there by 2030 by simply scaling up and incentivizing existing uh, renewable energy. Now, um, and, and that it's without nuclear technology. Now, uh, when it comes to, to nuclear energy, so we have to distinguish uh, between fusion and fission, conventional nuclear energy being fission, fusion, which seems to be always 10 years around the corner. Uh, we're always told that we're about 10 years from viable fusion energy. And it turns out what really is necessary for it to be viable isn't just that you get more energy out than you put in. You've got to get about 10 times as much energy out than you put in for it to be economic economically competitive with other sources of energy. So fusion is elusive, um, much as we might like it to be part of the solution because it would be a clean uh, nuclear technology. Um, on the other hand, uh, conventional nuclear energy, uh, fu uh, fission uh, nuclear energy comes with all sorts of uh, potential pitfalls, um, problems when it comes to proliferation and conflict, um, environmental contamination, and, and we've seen very vivid examples of that. Of course, I'm within an hour and a half of uh, of uh, Three Mile Island, um, where there was a, a very famous nuclear meltdown decades ago, reminding us of the environmental threat that comes from nuclear. So everything we do when it comes to, you know, there, there's no way to, um, to have no environmental footprint um, when you're trying to provide uh, energy for uh, nearly 8 billion and growing people in an increasingly energy intensive civilization. Uh, everything we do comes with an environmental footprint. Renewable energy comes with an environmental footprint. Um, and there's a larger problem that we have to contend with, which is how we live sustainably on this planet. But when it comes to the climate change problem, um, what we need to do is simply decarbonize our economy. And we can get there with renewable energy. It's just a matter of, um, you know, we, uh, let me, uh, for example, challenge Bill Gates when he says we need a miracle. We don't need a miracle. It's already there. It's the sun. It's the wind. It's geothermal. We have the necessary technologies. We just need policies that incentivize that. We're already moving in that direction. The problem is we're not moving fast enough to get those emissions reductions we need to avert catastrophic warming. We need to accelerate that transition. That means subsidies, incentives for renewable energy, um, and that means uh, some sort of price on carbon. Uh, we need an externality that, uh, you know, you can't dump carbon pollution into the atmosphere at no cost because it's having a negative impact on the planet. Um, so it's not rocket science. We know what the solutions are. We just need policymakers who are willing to implement them. And once again, it brings me back to the same place. In a matter of months, we have an opportunity to elect a president who will actually act on our behalf and put in policies, uh, you know, uh, support policies that, um, you know, reflect our interests rather than the polluting interests who currently govern the uh, Trump administration. I want to get at least one more issue on the table um, before, uh, at this juncture. Would anybody like to talk about um, religion um, as a force in the world over the next three decades? Uh, will it, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about whether it will be more of a force or less. Paul. Well, I'm on record is saying we're way overdue for a major new religion. Hundreds of religions start every year, uh, but most don't stick. Nietzsche put it nicely when he said, nearly 2,000 years and no new God. And um, I think it's really clear we're, we're in a new moment, not unlike Carl Jasper's axial age, where there's a crisis of belief. As I said earlier, this is an anthropological crisis. It's not technological. It's not virus-based. We are in an anthropological crisis. And, um, and really, the task over the next couple of decades is to figure out how to create a global civilization. And that could well be um, something that comes out of religion. And there are lots of places relig where religion can come out of. An obvious one is an environmental religion, but there are lots of other ways as well. Do you see any, Paul, do you see any threads? Do you see any shoots? I mean, you say hundreds of religions a year. Uh, 
anything promising? Oh, I yeah, there is. I've been I've been chasing this for well over a decade, and there is lots of really interesting stuff. Um, but it's it's all a little bit weird uh, and hard to describe in a couple of sound bites. I would just say that a belief in the environment, you know, the Gaian theory is a logical place for it to happen. Um, but to keep in mind there, and, and you know, I, I, I forget if it was uh, Carol Domain or who, who mentioned the, the 1755 quake of Lisbon, on, which happened on All Saints Day, of course, and it did create the opening for the Enlightenment because it left the sacerdotes in such stunned silence for a couple of years that the philosophers were able to to jump in, and <laughs> uh, and and I think this is this is a moment like that. Uh, we we just need a focal event that that will trigger it. Carl or Carmen or Banning, any thoughts about religion? Uh, Carmen first. I'll just say that uh, sort of to uh, to say the crazy thing out loud. I think one of the focal points could be some proof uh, that uh, we're not alone in the universe. Um, I actually did a tweet a few years ago, and I, my bet is by 2050 that there will be, I don't know what it will look like, but there will be something that will be very persuasive for a lot of people that uh, there's something much broader than humanity and this planet. And um, I'm not necessarily saying a god, but I, I think that the religion, you know, a clear, uh, most religions, a key aspect is that we human beings are somehow special compared to all the other stuff in the universe. And I think discovering some other stuff in the universe would really erode that. And so I think that that's, you know, a, a possible focal point. Just to bend the religion question a little bit, what I what I believe is very important and a, a huge factor is the loss of meaning in people's lives. I think that that fueled much of the support behind Trump. Uh, I think uh, it exists particularly in mature Western societies that have become rather tired and divided at the same time. And I think, and, and, and so many of the things that provided meaning in people's lives, religion, work, family, uh, have been uh, corrupted, have been eroded recently, although perhaps one good benefit of the pandemic is a resurgence of family uh, life. So I'll just stop right there because I see people have are raising their hands. Banning first and then Paul. Banning, do you, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, yeah. Couple of things. One, I, I think what Carmen said very, very interesting. I'll have a comment on the second. First of all, the the COVID nineteen crisis is the first. I think it's the first global crisis in human history, where virtually every person in every country on the planet is affected by this. Uh, unlike even World War Two, where there are plenty of people have sat it out. So this is a very interesting phenomenon. And the fun, and, and bottom line, of course, is that it's a global challenge. We have to solve it together. If you don't deal with it for everybody, then it's going to come back and get you, even if you're America first. Uh, so that's an interesting point. The second thing I would say is that any global religion that we're talking about has to believe in science and has to believe in facts and has to believe in some kind of notion of a common humanity, that our common humanity comes before our particular tribe. I think those three things, and then and, and the, we're all part of this earth. We're all connected to it, a, a Humboldtian view, uh, you know, that was really under uh, underlies uh, Gaia view. So I think that uh, the, that has to be part of it if it's going to be successful to save human civilization and be able to focus ourselves on climate change, you know, environmental degradation, all the list of issues that we know we face that are potentially catastrophic. So I think those it can't be a, a messianic religion. I don't think. And I, I just as a, maybe a point of humor, but I've really been reminded of in, the, the movie Independence Day. You know, that we face this, um, unfortunately it was aliens who were threatening, so I'm not advocating threatening aliens, but we face a, a threat to the entire world, civilization. And by the way, it was a scientist 
uh, computer scientist who figures out the problem. And uh, ironically, of course, the solution was to inject the virus into the mothership. Uh, but it was all, you know, the, and of course, the, the thing that's almost ludicrous today, it was led by the United States, right? Well, that's not happening. But it, it ultimately was they, when they figured out what to do, they sent out by Morse code to all the armies around the world how to bring them down, how to, how to defeat this thing. We'll call it let's call it a, a, a virus rather than call it an alien invasion. But it required a global effort and the scientists figured it out and let it, and then we made, made it a global response to the global challenge. So, that, I mean, that's a very st strange, I think, uh, maybe a metaphor for where we are today, but I, I do think it, 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 that's the kind of challenge we face. How can we believe together and trust each other enough in a global sense that, whatever our differences are, the challenges are greater and we have to cooperate to do it. And how can we lead that as an, an idea, a, 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 you know, an ideology, a philosophy, whatever, or a religion? Paul, Paul did you want to add something? Yeah, uh, I would not overstate what will happen when we find evidence of intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, if we should. Uh, my forecast is very simple. If we do find unequivocal evidence of such a thing, one third of humanity will want to convert it, one third of humanity will want to conquer it, and one third of humanity will want to sell it something. Um, I, I don't think it will have a big impact on religion. Uh, what it will have a big impact on is our view of space. You know, this is, this is a moment with space when it's not unlike Seneca's famous uh, prediction in Medea, there will come an age in the far future when an ocean shall unloose its bonds. In essence, the ocean ceases to be a barrier and becomes a highway. Um, I also really disagree with Banning about religion. Um, the, uh, it, it would be nice if it was an idealistic religion, but um, equally likely is that we have a response against science and technology and it becomes the new ghost dance, um, a, a global crisis cult, um, but you know, maybe not. So uh, EH added to you, to your point, uh, Paul, that, and one third will want to eat it. So <laughs> I'll, it I'll have to change that to 25%. Yes, we should all do not forget the Twilight Zone episode to serve mankind. <laughs> it's <Sorry>. a cookbook. <laughs> right. Donna. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, I, I really resonate with Carmen and others. Um, I think that one thing I wanted to validate was uh, the note in the chat of sort of male-dominated misogynist religion. Like just someone shouted that out. And, and you know, sort of racism, sexism, all the isms, it's Pride Month. And, and that there's a really interesting quote that I popped in the chat from, uh, it's in the Jefferson Memorial. And it says, I'm not an advocate of frequent change of law and constitutions, but laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. As that becomes more developed, more enlightened, as new discoveries are made, new truths discovered, manners and opinions change, and with the change of circumstance, institutions must advance also to keep pace with the times. We might as well require a person to wear still the coat that fit them as a child, as a civilized society to remain ever under the regime of their barbarous ancestors. And the barbarous is a good word because the brutality, you know, against people in our past and still now is, is unacceptable. And yet this is a hopeful quote. And I think whether it's religion or institutions or other things, you know, we see this with the Catholic Church, with Pope Francis, a modernization. And so, you know, another quote that's important is at the National Archives that says, um, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. And so it's yet again our turn, but we're making some progress towards that arc of justice and towards that future. And again, and my message is like the more of us that get to play and the more of us that support the doers that have that in all of us, the faster we can solve challenges and come together. Thank you. So we had as a nation uh, between a month and two months uh, to get ready to, for COVID and we, we, we didn't do very well. Apparently we didn't do as well as the um, Asian nations. I, I wanted to ask John Hennessy if how much of this is about leadership. Um, you've been exploring leadership um, for a couple of years now, um, formally. 
It is definitely about leadership, John. We've, um, we've recently done uh, two sessions with the mayor of Seoul, South Korea, and you notice South Korea did a pretty good job even, even in dampening down a second wave that, um, that came after they opened up. Um, and they, it was about leadership. It was about saying, here are the, some of it was also, some of us in the U.S. might find a little undemocratic. Like you need, a, you need to tell us you're going out of your house and where you're going before you leave your house. Um, but there was, a, there was clearly, a, a, first of all, not kidding themselves about the seriousness of it. They had had encounters with SARS, so they were prepared for it. I think we were very poorly led and we were led by somebody who said it's going to disappear and that was a real mistake. Um, this is not the first pandemic. 1918, Spanish flu, 50 million people died. 50 million people, right? You were, you were roughly five times more likely to die of influenza than you were to die as a soldier in the, in the First World War. Um, we should have learned from that and we should have been better prepared. And, you know, Bill Gates laid this all out in a TED talk um, and, and we all ignored it. Uh, this is a fundamental problem in this country, I think. It's the same, it gets to the issue of climate change that Michael talks so eloquently about. We do not pay attention to things until they're a crisis. Look at race relations. Look where we are right now. It has to be a crisis that summons us all to action. Um, but maybe this time we can make it an action that will change in a fundamental way. Can I weigh in, actually, with a, a quote of my own? Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, thanks. Um, so this is a quote uh, from Carl Sagan in his great book, The Demon Haunted World, uh, 1995. Okay, so uh, this was um, decades ago. I have a foreboding of an America in my children's or grandchildren's time when the United States is a service and information economy, when nearly all manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries, when awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few, and no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issues. When the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or no knowledgeably question those in authority, when clutching our crystals and nervously consulting our horoscopes, our critical faculties in decline, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what's true. We slide almost without noticing back into superstition and darkness. Now, uh, Sagan feared um, the impact of pseudoscience. I don't think he envisioned the sort of malicious anti-science that we've encountered, where powerful vested interests have literally worked to undermine the public faith in science uh, and technology and to uh, impact our politics uh, in a way that portrays um, you know, certain areas of science as a threat to the public interest. Um, so that's dystopia. Uh, Carl Sagan foresaw the possibility of that sort of dystopia. And of course, it sounds remarkably like what we're living through right now. Uh, and yet I want to read another quote of his, and it's from the, the um, novel and uh, then made into a movie, uh, Contact, which indeed is about uh, our, um, you know, making contact uh, with intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. Um, and, and, and so he also foresaw a positive vision of the future. And, and there's a quote that I think is wonderful, and it's from sort of the alien civilization communicating to the uh, astronaut uh, played by uh, Jodie Foster in the film. Um, he's uh, taking the form of her uh, deceased father, uh, saying, you're capable of such beautiful dreams and such horrible nightmares. And so he recognized the, the duality and the conflict within our species when it comes to the choice between dystopia and utopia. And I just thought those quotes were relevant to this conversation. Thank you. I, uh, you know, uh, after the election, um, I became fascinated with the 538 uh, website's uh, mm -hmm. Metapol. And um, through all of this, the last almost four years, um, it's, it's been a real barometer of how divided our society is. Um, and it's just stuck through everything. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, Donald Trump, has his popularity has hovered around 40%, minus or plus about 3 or 4%. I, I was startled by that initially, and then I thought that it was actually pretty profound, that it was, it was 
evidence of something that I don't completely understand. And I was wondering if I could get uh, one of you to step up to the question of the division in this society. Um, where does it fit with respect to leadership or is it about social media? What are the factors that have, have made that such a frozen number? Um, Carmen first. Just to make a comment, because I, I think it relates when people were talking about dystopia. We're a funny panel because we're not really very, well, ha, ha, ha. We're not very representative right. of the America or the world population. And we think it's dystopian, but I know there are, I don't know, well, let's say 40% of Americans who don't believe it's dystopian. And I think the figure is even higher than that. Um, you know, there's a, it, it <laughs> requires a certain amount of leisure time and thinking a lot to get so upset and, and um, so that to the point where this thinking that it's all dystopian is what dominates your thinking. That's definitely a minority view out there in the world. Or let me add to that, if it is dystopian, they feel it's dystopian for another reason. They can't get a job, they can't put food on their tape on the table. Their you know baby died when he or she was eight months old. So I think that um, we've got this divide that on the one hand you have this sort of intellectual class of which Silicon Valley belongs to, and then on the other hand you have a lot of other people who are just trying to live life and don't really care a lot about politics. And they can, they can get taken advantage of, cynically or not, by people who see politics as a game that they can win if they manage their photo ops uh, carefully enough. I'll stop there. Any other thoughts on the, on the divide? Yeah, Talk let me on. I think uh, there's a new uh, book out called Deaths of Despair by two Princeton economists um, that really at least for one subset of the American population does a really good job of analyzing the forces at play and why they've led to such great uh, divisions. And the big division is the one that Carmen alluded to, college educated versus not college educated. And it's become a determinant of so many outcomes in, in life now. On top of that, we then build systems which accentuate the divide. There's good evidence, demonstrated evidence now that the primary system basically picks uh, candidates that are more extreme than candidates that are, represent the middle of American thought about things. Uh, so I think we have to look both at our systems, but we also have to look at education and, and how we can provide better education to people. Just a question for John. Yeah. I, this is one I can't understand. How do we explain the, the well-educated, quite well-off Trump supporters? I mean, you know, people who, it's not, they're not necessarily stuck in the Fox Breitbart, you know, universe of, of thought and knowledge. They know, but they so still are a very, I th yeah, I, I think there are a small number of people. Some it's economics, although most people I know have not opted. Most people with wealth have not opted to vote for Trump, but there are some, there are some. The libertarians. A, a mill yeah. Bible, very fundamental Christians who care about who he puts on the Supreme Court. That's their, and they will vote that no matter what. Um, so I think we have this small group, but we have a larger group of Americans who, as Carmen said, they're disaffected. And he, that's, that's the group that Trump, uh, helped by the Electoral College structure, uh, animated. Yeah. Paul and then Carmen and then Mike. Sure. Uh, it's often a time where everybody is tempted to treat the symptoms and not the cause. Uh, you know, it's what's going on today, stating the obvious or reminding us the obvious. We're in this middle of this shift from mass media to personal media. Mm -hmm. And that personal media shift, whenever we have a new media shift, people go crazy for a generation or so. And then things begin to sort out. We've been through it before, but this is a moment in time in which digital media quite literally is the solvent leaching the glue out of our global institutions. 
and the shift to personal media has caused everybody to overemphasize on the personal voice. And it's working against the most fundamental thing we need to create a new global civilization. And it's a very old idea that the, the essence to the success of a society lies in social cohesion. Uh, it was first articulated by Ibn Khaldun in the 14th century in the Makadama, where he pointed out in his study of history of the North African tribes that smaller cultural units and, and city units prevailed over larger ones when they had higher social cohesion. The problem today is that digital technology has done more to s destroy collective social cohesion than anything else. And it's been going on for, uh, for four decades now. That's what we have to fight against. It isn't about creating new institutions or any other stuff. It is, you've got to go to the core issue. How do we recreate social cohesion when our technology that we invented is pulling us all apart? Carmen next and then Mike, I think. Oh, and then, uh, I'm sorry, Carol and, oh, Carmen, you're muted. Carol wants to talk and then Mike and then Carmen. I just wanted to admit that um, sitting just outside of Washington, D.C., I'm distracted by the fact that uh, a third huge metal fence is being erected all around the White House and the old executive office building today. And so um, this puts me in the mind of, you know, the everything that people have just said about what's contributing to these divisions and what Paul just said about the massive media shift. On top of that, we have to think about how this different um, information environment is being exploited by other actors. And uh, we know that, you know, this digitization um, of everything um, has enabled actors to attack basic democratic uh, systems. And I'd just like to say that the very uh, inviting and positive inclusive vision that Megan has helped us um, see is possible is threatened by what's happening right now. Um, and there is a, a unmistakable foreign uh, adversarial thread that runs through this. Um, and I'll just cite a couple books that have helped me. One I, I've finished, uh, The Road to Unfreedom by Timothy Snyder, which looks at how Russia used such tactics and how fascism works, which is about us versus them and how making our society or building on the divisions in our society is how fascism literally works. And so we don't want to be gloom and doom, but we do need to have situ situational awareness about this division in our society as a very serious vulnerability. Uh, Mike next and then Carmen. Yeah, well, sort of, uh touching on the same themes here. Um, and it gets back uh, once again to sort of the, um, you know, the, the, the foreboding that, uh, that, that Sagan had for a world in which, you know, ignorance is exploited by bad actors um, who prey upon uh, xenophobia and chauvinism and, and bigotry and intolerance. And we're, we're seeing that play out today. Um, we're seeing, uh, you know, as Carol just alluded to, uh, bad state actors exploiting that uh, and working together with the current administration to exploit that, that bigotry and chauvinism and nativism um, to divide uh, the, the electorate. And, you know, for uh, it, 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 understanding that that is uh, their path to re-election and continued power is, is a divided electorate rather than a united electorate and, and preying upon, you know, all of our intrinsic uh, weaknesses. Um, and, you know, Sagan, I think, like, you know, myself, um, he was a person of Jewish ancestry, and I'm sure he felt the, the legacy of um, the 1930s in Nazi Germany. And I'll just cite a number. Um, uh, this is just from the other day, uh, the latest Reuters poll um, finds 37 uh, no, percent, let me get uh, 30, 39 percent job approval um, for Donald Trump and, and 57 percent uh, job disapproval. Um, in the 1932 uh, German election, Hitler got 37 percent of the vote um, and his opponent got 55 percent of the vote. And I find the parallels between those numbers 
quite disturbing because it seems to speak to a universality um, when it comes to sort of a, a subset of our you know, of, of our civilization, of our people who are vulnerable to the forces looking to divide us along issues of race um, and gender. And I think we have to keep that in mind. Carmen, you're muted, but did you want to add something? Uh, I, oh, I actually you. was not, uh, had not raised my hand, but, oh. but at yeah. this point okay. now, I will say, uh, building on Michael's comment in particular, that I, I definitely consider the possibility of the U.S. breaking up into different countries as a result of the dynamic that we're on right now. That, I mean, I, you know, I think that, uh, and I'm not trying to be partisan here, but I think that if Trump believes that he's likely to lose the election, he'll switch his energies, his tactics to discrediting the election process. And I think if that happens, there will be uh, states, I think that will start the process where states will think about seceding because if you, because states control the election, the state is, the, an election is a state responsibility and each state has its own electoral college which convenes. So I, I could see something very ugly, well I don't know if it's ugly, it may in fact be the chaos that we need to reach a better place. So uh, before I uh, bring in Megan, you know, I just want to point out that Gavin Newsom has been referring to our state, California, as a nation state recently, and I don't think that's by accident. Uh, Megan. I just want to share with Canada. Canada. Uh, say it again. Just California and Oregon and Washington unite with Canada, maybe some of the, you know, the uh, East Coast, and just leave the red states in the middle of the Confederacy. Uh, called Ecotopia ones. Megan. I was just going to say, um, I was just on the Kofi and on commission around uh, democracy and election and tech and that word. And, you know, the, the challenges that we have of the media bias and the propaganda that can come through, as, as Paul's talking, like personalized media. Um, so some people are hearing one thing, some people are hearing others, a huge challenge. Um, it's in every country. Um, you know, Cambridge Analytica is out of business, of course, but it's still live with us in terms of the techniques and the, the taking of data and running personalized um, propaganda. And so it's hard for people because people have very valid grievances around bias, around economic inclusion, about the future. And so some demagogue can come through with a message that sounds, you know, it sa sounds okay, but it's not, and you're not hearing the whole story. Very urgent. I mean, it's very interesting to me that um, you know, in the current situation, Project Alamo was the name of the technology and tools. I, I put a link, there's a BBC report explaining it, 40 to 60,000 Facebook ads a day that was done for 2016 is now called Death Star by Brad Pascali, who built it, who runs the Trump campaign. Um, and it's not about one party, it's about using these technologies, good or bad, and really to, to get at people when they can't hear other things. So. I combine that and sort of harken back to John Hennessy, your point about education and access. And the sooner we can have people at all ages uh, building their confidence, building inclusion. I noticed Nancy Blackman and David Desjardins are on the call. You know, Nancy has been a pioneer about better ways to teach math. This is just a language. And we know that if you teach calculus, uh, the Mexico teams did uh, some wonderful research. So if you teach calculus in kindergarten as a language, it's learned better than waiting for high school. So including mathematics as not a contest thing and you got to achieve, but as something joyous that you do with mentors that's not a big race. And uh, stop making it about only certain topics that are only interest of certain people. Like it's about anything. Um, there's this wonderful thing that came out of a bunch of colleagues, DQ Institute, uh, DQ, like digital quotient, like TQ, tech quotient, uh, IQ, EQ, those things. Uh, let's, we can drop IQ. Um, but this idea of everybody having digital skills, you know, in English class, you would learn to edit Wikipedia and scripting and everyone would know how to code, like, stop biasing it. So that's like these flip sides of the education point that, John, you make is really about knowing what's happening to you and feeling more power about these tools and inclusion in general, as I've been speaking in general, but specifically around elections. So that this, these Death Star-like technologies can't be um, used against us. 
against all, all Americans. Let's talk just a little bit. I mean, Paul's point about social corrosion, societal corrosion, and um, social media. I wanted to push people a little bit about how to harness social media. Um, how do we harness Facebook? If Facebook is the reason we are where we are, and there's some evidence that that's true, do you do it through laws and regulations? Do we do it by modifying Section 230, or do we innovate our way out of this? Is there anything on the horizon that will replace Facebook and not be as corrosive a device? Anybody want? Paul, first. Well, I think Facebook's peaking, um, and Facebook is the logical end of the last chapter of social media that began with MySpace and others. Uh, I think the right place to begin is there's this very dangerous idea in Silicon Valley that technology is neutral. And John, you've written about this. Uh, and so I know you're the first one to disagree that <laughs> our technological artifacts are, are congealed culture and they're congealed values and assumptions. And Facebook is just the perfect congealing of the founders weird ideas. And if we start at that level, then say, how do we create, new platforms that reflect other cultural values is the way to go. Um, Facebook, I think, is going to collapse under its own weight. I'm not too terribly concerned about that. I'm more concerned about, can we build the new things the right way? Any other thoughts on Facebook? I, saw, I, don't, I don't know that I would comment on Facebook, but I think this shift that's occurred with social media and creating these so-called walled gardens and echo chambers, I, I don't see an easy way to make that go away unless you somehow induce people to create some sort of public square where there's some mixing. We've lost this. We've lost the town hall. People go into their Facebook echo chamber and they hear opinions that confirm their own biases. Um, I think this is a really hard problem, one which I have to admit that we in the Valley didn't see coming. We really didn't see it coming. Um, Carmen or Cal, do you want to talk at all about social media outside of the United States? Um, you know, we're only part of this equation. Hmm. I don't think I have uh, any particular knowledge or insight about how how it's different, um, so I would prefer not to, to comment. Fine. Carmen, do you have any thoughts? No, I, I don't have any thoughts other than to note the obvious that some countries, notably China, mm -hmm. have a very different policy or philosophy about social media and how to, how to control it. Mm -hmm. And well, I was also, I don't know how many, anybody else has read the book, The History of the Future, in 100 Objects. It was written by a guy who runs a gaming company, but also had a neuroscience degree. Anyway, I, I was always intrigued by his idea that at some point in the future, a new religion would emerge, a religion, kind of a, a philosophy of how to live around an app that people would compete to score points in, and that there would be some ulterior purpose behind it, but that you essentially, the app would tell you and reward you for how you lead your life. And that is certainly something that China is doing right now. That sounds very Black Mirror-ish. So, John, um, it's interesting you mentioned Black Mirror because uh, the, the producer creator of that used to make more documentary and he actually decided to go more into sort of a fiction space to capture more people's imagination and reach out on things that he was very concerned about. So it's interesting use of, of, of media. Just to your last point, um, on the commission, the Kofi Annan Commission, we did spend time with various groups. And I would note that the team in Mexico, that's election was 2017. So they had the Brexit and other things that happened. So they, they noticed ways that they as a commission to, could quickly share knowledge. And there were some great practices that came out of that. Second thing that happened is the electorate, elect, the electorate, the citizens themselves were more conscious of the gaming of the system. So the combination of those two, I would say, you know, very similar to the leadership in Minnesota, who noted that uh, those who were the majority of the people on our streets are very peaceful protesters. And there's a set of people who are creating uh, violence, uh, rioting, burning buildings, those things. 
and that and that well some of those people may be extremists some of them are also infiltrating on purpose to do that to to be hurtful so the more conscious we all are of what's going on around us even if it's com complex i would note you know at the beginning of the call i had to uh, join by phone because it was the only moment we could get the cap and gown for the drive-through graduation of my high school senior uh this year he's born we noted of the class of 2020 they were all born, the high school class are all born right as 9-11 happened. There's no world that's not complicated that they've lived in. And that's, I think, why Gen Z, Gen Z you know, John, you have them on your campus at Stanford and all of us have them uh, around. They're so understanding complexities and still able to move like the Parkland kids. And I'm excited about them mm -hmm. and their future. And the college kids who were entering kindergarten on 9-11 times and are now graduating this year. I'm excited for these colleagues joining us, what they're doing on the streets, people like Brittany Packett, the group that's doing the 21st century policing uh, work that President Obama originally led, that coalition of collective genius, you know, asking our leadership to sign up to, you know, all the things that are the best practices that are around in a few places that could be ever, these kinds of moves, collective genius, better sharing, using the internet, for the utopian goals that it was founded on faster and sooner and whistleblowing on when it's not so that more people have consciousness and are respecting, respected for their ability to do something about it when they see it. Um, and including the last thing I'd say is if Facebook had more gender balance, race balance, geo balance, topic balance, uh, we would have less of a problem with their products, I think, if Mark would allow it. I think that's one of the central things. I'm sure there were many engineers in those rooms, especially diverse engineers, trying to get rid of bullying, trying to get rid of fake news, trying their hardest, and their priorities were dismissed for shipping the product, uh, which is one of the central challenges in Silicon Valley is sometimes we talk about X, you know, all these X, it's really X, Y, like how can we broaden this out and include the rest of the world, like, and these master tools, or just even move to another space where, more funding could go to others as well. It's an and. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of the, the challenge that we're supposed to be addressing here in the next three decades, I'm very curious about the consequences of the pandemic that might be macro. And I was wondering in particular, you know, the world has been globally gathering in cities uh, increasingly, you know, despite these science fiction notions about suburbanization, we've actually been urbanizing. Does anybody in this group believe that the pandemic is enough of a forcing function to reverse that? Paul first, and then Carmen. So it, what it's going to do is increase the diversity of choices. We're not going to flee cities. Uh, the great irony of the current situation is that everybody's figured out that living downtown isn't fun during a pandemic because all the restaurants are closed. And the, the super rich paranoid have discovered that their former Titan missile bolt holes are about fun for maybe 15 minutes and they miss their mansions. Um, the uh, charismatic exurbs uh, are discovering that, like Aspen, that they are COVID hotspots. And so the great irony is that the safest place to be in this pandemic is in the one place everybody wanted to get out of, the suburbs. That, you know, the boring rancher suburban house in Cupertino with a bit of a yard and close access is, is a good thing. As a forecaster, I deal with indicators. And an interesting indicator is what's happening in Carmel last week, that there is a real estate boom in Carmel, California, because a whole bunch of people have realized, thanks to Zoom, they can live full time in a nice little place like Carmel. And all the wealthy Texans have decided that instead of timeshares, they would be better off with their own house. Um, so I think what this does is it, it doesn't reverse the trend towards urbanization. You know, 2009 was the year that the first time in human history, our human population became majority urban. New York thought it had a, happened 100 years earlier, but it really only happened in 2009. That's not going to reverse, in part because, as Stuart Brand has so brilliantly written, it's the place of economic opportunity. But what we're going to see is a species radiation of lots of different options of people exploiting the opportunity to live in different places. 
Anybody else? Uh, Benny, want to chime, chime in? Yeah, I think probably have to look, distinguish between the developed world and the emerging market countries, whatever you want to call them. I mean, we have the luxury of saying, okay, I, gee, I'd rather live where Paul lives in the suburbs than live in the middle of New York City or whatever. But I think that, you know, before the pandemic, certainly the, the predictions were, the forecast, I would say, was we're going to add between two and three billion people to cities by 2050, maybe two billion people to the global population. That is, will be 70% maybe urban of nearly 10 billion people. And I don't know that that trend is going to change, especially in Africa and Asia and other places I mean, where it's really not a lot of options. I mean, people don't go to cities because they're, they, they can now move from the burbs into the nice high-rise apartment. They're trying to survive and they're looking for jobs and they're moving off of the, the uh, rural economy. So I don't know that, that, could, that the option is there to change, but certainly uh, I, I, they're very aware and favelas and slums around the world, the, the fact that they cannot do social distancing. They can't get clean water and soap that they are much more vulnerable to the pandemic than those of us who live in nice single houses or apartments where we can just, you know, wall ourselves off from everybody. So uh, this is really a problem. I think that all these cities, whether it's Lagos or it's, you know, uh, Santiago or uh, Dakar, whatever, are going to have to be figuring out what do we do now with the, the fear of this pandemic and future pandemics. Uh, but we're going to be adding more people. And, and, you know, this is, I mean, think of that. It's a couple Tokyos a year of, of expansion of urban centers. I mean, how do we do it? Do we get, you know, Lagos or, or, or Karachi or Copenhagen? What are we going to get? So this, is, this problem is going to be with us big time of the whole question of urbanization uh, throughout the world. And, and then how do you, you know, urban is where people live, so that's where we have to especially deal with climate change, right? How do we green these cities? How do we how do we move to transportation systems that aren't just more fossil fuel cars, which everybody wants in the developing world, uh, understandably? So I think the urbanization problem is is going to be with us, uh, but maybe there are more opportunities to to bend the ears of people to see alternative ways of urbanizing alternative structures. As Ban Ki-moon said, that, you know, the, the war on climate change is going to be won or lost of how we do urban. And I think uh, Michael, I'm sure, would, would agree with me on that one. That, you know, this is, this is the opportunity and this is the danger. If we don't get it right in cities, we've lost the battle. Um, so that, that battle is still going to be with us. And even though the rich people in the developing world can think, oh, gee, I'll, I'll move out to the burbs or go to my Hampton's uh, uh, second home, but that's not an option for more than a, a tiny percentage of the world's population. So let, let me ask a, an artifact of, of, of that question. Uh, let's say we have a therapy or a vaccine, best possible case in a year, and people actually could go back to work. They could go to the supermarket safely. Um, how much has this been a, a forcing function? Are we so in love with Zoom and so in love with Amazon that we will change our our behaviors uh, post-pandemic? Paul first. So, as I said, I'm a futurist with a past. And way back in the 1980s, I spent a lot of time doing one research study after another about um, uh, video conferencing and groupware and trying to explain to companies why it was a useful tool. I even wrote a paper for AT&T's management titled Believable Broadband for Business. Uh, now, in retrospect, after the last several months of endless Zoom meetings, the, <laughs> my temptation is to throw a Molotov cocktail into the server farm of Zoom so we finally get some peace and quiet. Um, I don't think we're, it's, it's not, is this substitute for something old? It's a world of this and the next thing that what we've discovered through this period is what real-time video conferencing, its strengths and weaknesses, and that is going to be incorporated into business. That it's just the continuing pattern of unlocking the tight coupling between what we do for work and where we do the work. And so it's gonna recede a bit back after this is over, but it's going to remain as an essential business tool. And also there's going to be a whole new wave of startups 
who say there are better ways to do this. Whenever we have a new technology, we always use it to do an old thing in a slightly different way. A classic example is plastic. When William Bakeland invented Bakelite thermoset resin, everybody spent their whole time trying to make it look like wood and tortoise shell. And about 10 years in, they eventually realized it made really tacky tortoise shell and they let plastic be plastic and things got interesting. Well, thanks to this pandemic, we're fast forwarding through the Bakelite phase of video conferencing. And you know, this is why I love the fact that there are all these layoffs from Uber and Airbnb and engineers are disgusted with Zuckerberg and leaving. Because remember, Zoom was started by a refugee from WebEx. And so in this chaos, we're throwing all sorts of entrepreneurs out of companies and they're sitting around with big ideas, no adult supervision and shoestring budgets. And so I am absolutely certain we're going to see an explosion in new forms of media startups in the next 12 to 24 months. And we'll look back and laugh at the idea that we ever did something as stupid and old fashioned as stare at each other in real time on computer screens. <laughs> So, uh, John and Megan, you've been at this in terms of interface for a long time. You know, virtual reality has been the technology that's on its way to being the next big thing for 30 years now. I, I you know, before when I could, I used to walk down the streets in San Francisco and think that people staring at the palm of their hand couldn't be the end of user interface. There had to be a next thing. And I've been thinking that for a half a decade. Um, is there a next thing after, after the iPhone? Well, there's always the next thing, John, I think. Uh, but I, I'm with Alan Kay here. I would prefer to work on inventing that next thing rather than trying to predict exactly what it is because the predictions are often wrong. I mean, I think there are ways we can do really clever um, environments that create something that is as good as being there. Um, it's harder to do with large groups of people uh, than it is to do, say, one-on-one. -on -one. We can, I can, use, we can do something one-on-one -on -one, um, that is completely immersive and, and works as well. I, I think, I think we have changed. I think, I think this Zoom experience is going to cause people. I think the valley. The first thing you're going to see is a lot more work from home, and, and that that's going to be a change that it, it's not 100 percent, but it's significant, and you'll see that play out in lots of ways uh, going forward. Uh, we also want to get, you know, work from uh, some place in the middle of the country, right? And these, the middle of the country really needs some sort of tech jobs to grow there because that's where so much growth opportunity is. Um, and if we could figure out how to do this using, using connection technologies, we'd be, we'd be better off. Yeah, I, yeah I'm in, in uh, our old General Magic days, you know, sort of... <laughs> Uh, it's funny, um, the movie is being more successful than the company was. Um, <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, eventually it went supernova with all the ideas that were directionally correct. Um, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm with John, you know, like I'm, I'm reminded of the movie Harold and Maude with the smell machine, like who knows where we're going. I'm hopeful that um, we can be more expensive about who gets to get fueled and funding and coaching. Um, from many more places uh, because I bet there's of the seven billion call it plus colleagues we already have someone already has these solutions um, and and only a tiny fraction would be in Silicon Valley they could be anywhere um, so Tesla I said think about the universe's energy frequency and vibration so quantum you know who knows what we'll figure out and learn and certainly um, Native American colleagues have held on to knowledges that are relevant um, in, in this conversation uh, for how we might interact. Um, Gloria Steinem, uh, one of her coaching points is gather, gather often. The world is linked, not ranked. And as we work on more equality and more inclusion, I think we have to keep those things in mind. And, and so we are very social being humans are social, so we want to be together. And there are things we don't understand probably about being together, pheromones and connection and, and you know, what, what it is about frequency, vibration and energy in us. 
and others when we're connected. So we have to be very mindful of that and respectful of the diversity of those experiences and making sure that many people have a voice in how that is. So we just don't create, you know, one of the things we're doing with artificial intelligence and Joy Buu Alamwini, Algorithmic Justice League, wasn't able to join the conversation in the end, but, uh, you know, her point is everyone has a face. And so face recognition is everybody's design opportunity. And right now, face recognition only works, um, works she calls it the pale male data set. It works very, very well on some people, like in the 90%, and it works in the 70%. I, I encourage everyone to watch her AI, Ain't I a Woman, Sojourner Truth, uh, Reeve Envisioned under AI. So this stuff is really relevant. We're codifying sexism and racism and systemic bias into our algorithmic code when Ada invented the idea, but she's not in the room, and women of color are certainly the most left out. Of in terms of funding and coaching on what they would build. So that's my thought, you know, with John, I, th I think we don't know, we have to do it. And my hope is that we broaden out who gets supported to bring it forward with us together. John, I wanna put three lines under what Megan just said. Sure. Um, Megan is absolutely, as always, spot on. Um, and we're in a really dangerous moment here why, again, as someone who has followed the remote work technology for three decades, it absolutely terrifies me that the light bulb has gone on over the heads of companies that this is a great way to monitor their companies even more closely. And you know, I remember the first time I visited a call center in Mumbai and saw what life was like there uh, for people in the cubicle farms the problem is that companies are starting to automate all the wrong things about remote work. And so working at home for a minority of people might sound like an idyllic existence, but I think for the majority way things are headed right now, if we're not careful, is that we're creating, it's not the electronic cottage, it's the electronic tiger cage in which to trap minimum uh, wage employees and capture their every click and every thought. And that just scares the living but Jesus out of me. I, I'm not gonna ask you uh, uh, to answer this question directly because predictions about the future are really hard. Um, but I do wanna, you know, the, the, the pages of the business sections of the, uh, of the webs on the web and the newspapers have been littered with discussions of U-shaped versus V-shaped recoveries which is of course very optimistic. It assumes there will be a recovery. But I was wondering if someone would sort of step up to how we think about the economic situation and, and what looks like it's on the horizon. Are there thoughts? Not the stock market, John, the economic situation. <laughs> Not the, the economic situation, writ large. I, I think it's a, it was a fast down, it's gonna be a slower up, sort of a U with one side stretched out further. That's probably likely, you just can't rebuild some of these industries that fast. And, and some things, travel, entertainment, they're gonna be impacted for quite some time to come. Yeah. Paul. Uh, I, I am struck by the fact that we seem to have multiple parallel worlds on the planet. So we're, we've all noticed with astonishment how the stock market seems blissfully unaware that there's a crisis and, and there, there are solid economic reasons behind it. That, um, you know, uh, there's a, a, a oft heard saying in Moscow that in Moscow every day is Monday or every day is Friday and in the rest of the Russia every day is Monday. And it feels like that's more and more the case even here in the United States. There are a lot of people trapped in eternal Mondays and a lot of people who are enjoying eternal Fridays. And because of personal media, they're, they're passing each other in the night, except when the folks stuck on Monday happen to block the freeway and interfere with the people who are living in Friday. But of course, the people who live in Friday will have personal aircraft pretty soon anyway. So. The fact is that it's not, it does, the, the interdependences in the economy also seem to be coming looser. And the question is, is that truly foundational or, you know, is this just another case that would be a chapter in the revised edition of 
Charles Mackay's late Victorian classic, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. Carol, you, I saw your hand. Well, one of the really critical uncertainties about all this, uh, especially as regards the economy, is uh, will a vaccine or some effective and safe treatment be um, developed? Uh, when will that be? And can it be distributed in an equitable way? And according to the experts I've heard, and I know Fauci has changed this a little bit lately, um, there's just no guarantee that uh, this is going to happen. I mean, Fauci said 12 to 18 months, and others say with more freedom to speak, that that would require everything to be go perfectly. So my main uh, point, and I have just finished these alternative scenarios out to 2023 based on some interviews, is that if this crisis, we're at the beginning perhaps of this pandemic, and um, there's some positive things to, to note about it in terms of compliance with the stay at home thing, uh, edicts that we couldn't have imagined a few months ago, but it's been enormously disruptive for everyone. And the longer it goes on, I think we are looking at, um, you know, someone said perfect storm earlier, but we're going to see more of a convergence of things that are already in the pipeline, like extreme weather events, hurricanes, uh, drought, on top of an already um, prostrate economy that's just, you know, totally on its back. So um, this, uh, and then if there is a vaccine, if it's not equitably, or people suspect it's not equitably being distributed, then um, uh, there's just so much turbulence that's still uh, coming and, you know, I want to emphasize the positive, but I also need to uh, underscore that uncertainty. Very good. Uh, Benning. Well, I think on the, uh, just on the vaccine side, I mean, my sister, Lori Garrett, has, has said that the very best case is, is three years. If even if we get a vaccine within 12 to 18 months, then there's the manufacturing and getting it to seven and a half billion people. And we face all sorts of obstacles with patents and everything else. But even if you did manufacture it, it probably needs to be something that is uh, a, a nasal spray or taken orally or a little patch if it actually requires syringes and, and refrigeration and more than one dose. How are you going to get that to all these people? You're going to need armies of people. And I don't mean military, but armies of people, volunteers going to every place on the planet. This is, it's almost impossible to think that this, we could vaccinate the planet within three years, uh, maybe, but that's very much the best case. And the other piece is just that there, you know, the, uh, we're going to get spikes. I mean, we're already not clear what's going to happen with the Ozarks and the South and all the people rushing out to, you know, they're, they're free, they're free, they're going to go out and party and have a good time. Uh, there's super spreaders out there and we could have a big spike even in this country in the near term. But there's the whole question of the, you know, going into the developing world, which is just really starting to get hit, especially Latin America, and it will be Africa, and then coming back to the Northern Hemisphere again. So it's, it, it, it is actually not certain we'll ever get rid of COVID-19. It may be around for a very long time, and that's going to have economic impacts. I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic about this kind of V-shape or hopefully a U-shape like John said, Recovery. I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, so we say, um, wishful thinking on Wall Street, and uh, and I've been wrong before, so I'm probably wrong now. But I think that we could really have very serious, uh, you know, resumes of lockdown. There's we have 40 million people, you know, on unemployment. We have a demand side problem, a supply side problem. The industries that John said. I, I'm not sure this is all going to come roaring back the way that Wall Street hopes it will, uh, some big V-shaped uh, return uh, just on the eve of the election to uh, bring back Trump. I, I, I think that if you look at the IMF uh, forecasts, which are, you know, some say in one case they said it could be worse than the Great Depression, uh, the CBO, the forecasts are not very positive by the economists and the people that are not necessarily invested in Wall Street. Uh, I, I, I pretty concerned that this is going to be a little worse than, than a lot of people uh, seem to think. We're, we're coming up against the top of the hour. Megan, did you want to, I saw yeah, you want to, one thing quickly. A quick thing that I saw uh, Jose in the chat talking about uh, perspectives from other places. And I just wanted to share that when we run the United Nations Solution Summit, people from all over the world bring, bring solutions forward. And 
And it's incredible to see what we already have that's working or promising. One of them out of Wales was a, a vaccine a cooling solution that was so genius and uses the fact that water is heavier at, at, as it just before it freezes at four degrees. So you never know what we might do. And I just wanted to share this coin. Um, this is a little bit of a US thing, but it's, you know, in the United States coins, they say liberty, but we found that the very first penny in the United States was uh, by Franklin and Jefferson in Washington was called, uh, it said liberty, the parent of science and industry. So this idea that science and technology and freedom can be connected is from 1792. And again, on our US archives, uh, vigilance, um, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. And so I think this using technology for good with each other, scouting for all the doers, being inclusive, we went on a 25 city tech jobs tour in 2017 and 18 and found genius Americans already fixing things in Birmingham and you know Cleveland and Cheyenne and everywhere and so lifting up the talent is what I hope you know that's been my message through our conversation but and 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 understanding the complexities the things like this panel what can we illuminate together can we use the internet for that that's the direction we could take if we want to go towards the positive I think and we can go very wrongly if we don't John nice. Yes. Uh, I suggest that you give Dennis a minute to, or two to wrap up. Yes. He has not okay. said anything all day, and okay. I think he should, we should hear from him. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for participating. And Dennis, why don't you chime in with uh, the future of EE380? Well, EE380 e continues in a sort of random way with uh, talks uh, on all sorts of subjects, this uh, covering a uh, uh, pretty broad base today. Uh, we still don't have an answer as to whether we're going to have a world to come to in, in uh, 2050. Uh, 2030 is even iffy. Uh, but it's been a fascinating discussion, and I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, it's been marvelous. And uh, we have plans for another, another one of these uh, uh, that's to look into other parts of the world. Uh, and uh, there will be information out on that in a, something like a month. And uh, I think we'll continue. This, uh, this was extremely uh, uh, fascinating. And I, I want to thank all of the panelists for their, uh, uh, their participation. Um, the, uh, the tape will be up on YouTube, so everyone will be able to watch uh, what they said, if they want to. Or people who missed it can catch up. And um, thank you very much.